It's kind of magical. <laughs> so, what was I going to show you? Yeah, so, yeah, this is good. How much time do I have? Does it matter? Enough time to go drink beer afterwards? 30 minutes. Okay, yeah. A total of 30 or 30 left? 30 more. Oh, sweet. And then questions. And then time for questions. Yeah, great. So, um, the Docker, Docker Run has a number of things that it can do. So, you can always call like Docker Run help, dash dash help, or some iteration like that. This is where you can actually say, you know, which which things you want. You can bind mount things into a container. You can publish certain ports of a, of, a, of a running container. So you might have some service that exposes, you know, an admin port and all these different ports. But all you want is the HTTP port. You can say just publish just that one port. I don't want anybody else to see your admin port. Please don't show it. You, you can pass all those parameters into Docker Run. <laughs> so here I'm going to show you Docker Run detached mode. I'm just going to run in a busy box, which is um, it's like a two two and a half or four meg image. It's very very tiny, but it does enough. I'm going to say pinggoogle.com. So, so what's the dash? Yeah. So I'm actually going to run this in detached mode just to show some of the other functions of Docker. And all things being equal, it ran. It returned me a hash. And so what does the hash mean? I can come over here and say Docker PS. Show me, show me what's running. Docker PS shows you containers. By default, it shows you running containers. You can say PS dash A, show me all the containers, even, even the ones that I had run and are dead now. So here, you notice this big long hash. I have the beginning of it right here. They give you some funny names also, like a random name generator, uh, but it really doesn't matter. Either, either, one, either, one, either the name or the ID will work. For this situation, we'll, do, we'll go with Berkeley Franklin. Um, so I could actually say Docker logs of Prickly, Frank, Prickly Franklin. Nothing. Docker attach to Prickly Franklin. Maybe I'm not on the network. Somewhere it's actually pinging. <laughs> yeah, Wi Fi. Here we go. There you go. Yes. Okay, so it was actually it was it was actually wow. working. It just wasn't <laughs> working well. Yeah. yeah. So nonetheless, it, it, I actually so what, what you just saw here is that I ran it in detached mode, like start pinging this thing, and so I could actually have. For, let's do it again. Ping local. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So here I'm I'm outside the container here, but I can actually see when I PSEF grip. That, that, that a PID is actually pinging Google.com. It it's, running, it's running as root. Yes. Who said that? Me. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 a lot of things default as root. You can create users, and there's even a syntax to say when, you, when you're building an image and you want it to run something like HTTPD, you can. There's actually an instruction to say run as user. You know, Apache or HTTPD or whatever it is. On if I ran a right. Docker command, if I did like Docker run some image, run a command, mm -hmm. could that in any way, shape, or form that command as root modify the host, the system on which you're running? <laughs> <laughs> Try it. It depends on what you what you are no run. absolute stars. <laughs> yeah, it depends on what you're what you're running. It's like just suppose it's no, so, to do something bad. Yeah. So, hey, here, type Docker run this. If you're giving somebody access to your host to run Docker run, you're assume that you're giving them root access to your box. So if you're sharing, a, and, 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 and also in this model, if you notice, I call it Docker as a limited user, and a PID started on the host as root. Anybody see that? Yeah. Okay. So what's actually happening here is that Docker is a two-step two tango. When you 
want to play with Docker? Two virtual two step tank. I was raised a Southern Baptist, you don't think <laughs> So when you actually want to run Docker, there's plenty most distributions now have like an init script to start this. So you know Etsy init D or service Docker start, whatever. You actually have just a daemon that's running. This is not detached. There's no Docker run here. This is actually Docker daemon. So this daemon is actually running as root. And so then you can either say as a user, pseudo Docker, or most distributions now will then also provide a Docker group so that you actually are in the group that can issue calls to this daemon. This daemon does all the heavy lifting. The, the in Docker run, Docker PS, Docker attach is just saying, hey daemon, what is this thing doing? And the daemon tells you. So it's a two two part crew. So you need to add your user account to that Docker group, or just run sudo if you're a sudo person. Um, so that's that's one thing. That's kind of an implication here that you call them to. The second part of this is that operationally, many people are working towards the environments that people or their code is running in is in the container. They're not the ones actually issuing Docker run. Sysadmin, I call the Docker run. Because yes, you can actually do some, some shenanigans. If you have access to call Docker run, you can do things in the container that affect the, the, the host. There's a lot of people working tirelessly right now to work around this. So, Within it's, just, so it's similar to breaking out of a true root. If you can do it. Sure. Yeah, and, and this is why, like, even presently, Red Hat's putting a lot of work into making sure that not only that you can have proper C group inheritance, but also, like, SE Linux labeling within the, the PIDs that are running so that I say, you can go nuts. I know you're not going to do anything outside of this. So there, there's a lot of work around that. But um, if, if you're giving somebody access to run, to run Docker run, assume that you've just given them root to your box. Any other questions around this? Sure. Can you trust what's inside the container? So let's say I was attacked and I just talked in front on an image that someone else has given me. Say I don't necessarily trust what that someone else has given me. Mm -hmm. Can I be sure that it won't break out of the container and do something to my host? Or is that the same question? That was sure. No, it, it, is, it is an interesting one. So. I don't know how far people have taken it in the security community to just say how nefarious of a box can I, you know, can, image can I create and bust out where, you know, anywhere somebody just says Docker run. I, I don't know how far or what limits there have been tested on that. A lot of people, like I said, are working tirelessly. I'm not involved in a lot of that. But I can say that within Docker, the code that's actually allowing this, this PID to run and is setting up the, the environment for that PID or the PIDs to run is doing this all through different syscalls. And so the syscalls actually are mapped back to what is privileged and non-privileged. And so there's plenty of things that you can go do inside of a container. Um, so here I'll say docker run dash i dash t dash and so I, here's two new flags for you, I and T. This actually says, I, I want to connect my terminals together and I want to pipe standard input and output. So here I am inside of a container and I can say who am I, I'm root. Uh, PID one, I'm root. Uh, but you, you you can only do certain things within this container. You can't actually, you couldn't mount out other other devices within it. Uh, you, you actually, there's there's a number of certain syscalls that normal tools expect that just won't work. Uh, and, and there's actually a flag to say, uh, to, to allow these kind of privileged connections. And so this, 
how that goes to stay there. Um, so there, there's actually a privileged flag to allow this kind of stuff because you might put them into a container where they have access, access to maybe a real ethernet, maybe a, a VETH, and they want to do some manipulation to that ethernet device or whatever. If you give them privileged access, they're actually modifying the host's ethernet. Without it, those syscalls just drop off. Like, it, it doesn't work. So making a nefarious container, possibly. Um, I would welcome people to do that because there's a lot of people anxious to fix it. Other questions? That's all. Somebody. Okay. So this might be taking a little far. In theory, you could run Docker on just a bare install and run, well, pull and run an image of an operating system and run that similar to how you would a VM or a Chiroot on in that way mm -hmm. and have a full from a uh, just from a docker have multiple uh, operating systems run that way yes. similar virtualization not virtualization well virtual machines it, it, in, it, environments to where yeah. you could say I've got a host that, that may or may not be kernel enough to get it off the ground it's attached to the world and I can talk to this box and it's now running Docker, and, the, and I have some way to say, Docker, spin up a new container that's Fedora. Docker, spin up a new container that's Ubuntu. Docker, spin up a new container that's Arch Linux. And these boxes are running next to each other. <coughs> the, the, you know, the, the instructions I've told them, or the however I've configured that environment, is exactly for those types of Linux flavors. But there's not like a virtual hypervisor, you know, virtual machine hypervisor layer that's taking up all this other resources. It's just like PID to kernel, PID to kernel, PID to kernel. So is this more like virtuoso open VZ? Is this LSC? Uh, it has been. Um, and uh, I'll, I'm, I'm not very familiar with virtuoso, actually. Because um, I have some uh, machines that are uh, at a hosted environment where. It seems very similar to this, but it's a few years old technology uh, where all the processes are running at the same time under the same kernel, but you only see your processes. Yes, you like gels. A lot of people are familiar with like BSD gels or other other Nix, Unix like gels, jail, and uh, it's very much like that. You could you could have ten MySQLs running, but your only sees itself. And so, depending on how you plummet for the port, you know for the ports or whatever else, you could have them all running on the same host. Um, I, wrote, I wrote like a web server for this and scaled it up to on a, a lesser laptop than this. Scaled it up to 500 instances of a web server running, and none of them knew about the other one, and they all had their own port. They were just serving traffic. <coughs> what was your question? Oh, so, so you said it has been LXC, so that makes it sound like it may not be in the future? So like like the graph drivers for how it actually layers the images, you know, <coughs> the file system side of it, the running of containers is an exec driver. And so there's actually multiple exec drivers. There had been a shrewd one. Um, the, the primary one for a long time had been actually calling the LXC tool, came, tool chain. Um, we uh, got a system D in spawn written one. Uh, it's not even in most system Ds that people are playing with, but still it's, it's a similar invocation to have like a machine or application container. Um, anyhow, so we've had, we've had all these different exec drivers rolling along. And in this last release, this earlier this week of Docker 0.9.0, they rolled in probably one of the more significant changes yet, opposed to the device mapper copy on write driver, which allowed it to go to all Linux, it's not just Ubuntu. They rolled in libcontainer, and they have rewritten effectively everything that LXC did in NATO Golang, and there's no more shelling out to any kind of other tools. And so it kind of eliminated all the discrepancy of on my Linux when I'm running the Docker daemon and it's trying to start up you know this version of LXC doesn't jive with this and this version of LXC doesn't jive with that and a lot of different complaints that way so now the current exec driver is LXC like 
but it's actually not calling any of the LXC toolchain. It doesn't require it to even be installed on the host. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You can run different kernels. What's that? You can run different kernels for the images that you're running. The images have no kernel. The images are completely, they, they don't have, the images wouldn't run like an init stack, an init, uh, more or less, and don't have a um, kernel of their own. They, they, they just assume that the kernel's already running. Yes? So could you compare this then to pair virtualization and how this feels like a lighter way for the Sun containers? Like yes, a lot of people can, can compare it to the Sun containers. And how does it compare to pair virtualization? I'm not familiar enough to say. Yeah. You're not just using some of the host hardware, you use all of the host hardware, and you're using the host kernel, the host init, all of that. So it takes like, basically it's like the application layer, that's my understanding, mm -hmm. it's kind of what you're passing containers to. Yep. Uh, some of your device nodes won't, won't be quite the same. You'll have just enough access to device nodes as you need. You random, random, zero, TTY. So you won't be able to just write out the dev SDA unless you're giving privilege and they mount that in. So there's some differences there. Yeah. Now that the executor is a configuration choice, do you perceive that we might actually be able to run these inside of a truly virtualized? So you could take a container, an image that you don't trust, mm -hmm. and launch it inside a more cleanly separated virtualized environment. So most of the time you get the performance benefit of being just processed to kernel, mm -hmm. but could you take the same image someday and execute it here? There are already projects to have the images or containers generated like when you export an image to be so portable that it just could take, like I could build an image here and it could be imported and run on Docker or it could actually be taken to another environment. Um, and like I said, there's there's a couple of different flags you can play with here to actually export, or import, or load or save an image. And they do different things, but it mostly has to do with how I've gotten it built just right, now export it ready to ship somewhere else. Or I could just run it within my Docker environment. And there's already some, um, some groups working on monetizing it such that every every instant you know, like out in the cloud you you can run a docker command and it basically puts it into a clean vm environment that runs your docker container so even if you did get crazy they're just throw away that vm and you wouldn't actually have a vulnerability with that. <coughs> yes um, quick question um can you run say vnc out of the Oh my gosh! Yes. Yeah, there, there's there's there's, ar there's already some people working on making it so seamless that you can have Docker running inside of a Linux VM on a Mac OS host and VNC into the box that's running, you know, VNC to your Docker image that's running on a virtual machine, so that you can have Firefox from Linux display on a Mac OS desk desktop and do. Any number of nonsense things. I mean, like it's. So it's I get that question a lot. Uh, it's one of those where, it, when it comes, most people I think are knees deep into like, oh man, we can do like Mongo and this thing and MySQL and this thing and have like a single MySQL container and ten different HTTPD containers and plumb them all together and have this really interesting redundant environment. And then that question comes along and everybody stops and they go, well, if you do that. Yeah, we can make that work. <laughs> and why you would want to do that, I'm sure somebody has a reason, but yes, oh, say, it, it can work. Now, say you I have a graph plot <laughs> yeah. that I want to put into its own container so I don't touch my actual host. Yeah. And, and it starts approximating other things that people are reading about where you have like library OS and everything's so driven down to where you don't even realize that the apps that you're running on your desktop are completely isolated from each other. So if somebody did you know, violate your um, Mozilla instance or Chrome instance that it wouldn't make it any further than that application. So there's, there's, there are use cases for it, and I'm sure many people will be working towards making that better. Have you seen Core OS? Oh, yeah. So how does that fit in all top of the world? Very much. How much have you read about it? Not much. Yes. Okay. Okay. So there's a couple of different initiatives working towards the same question. So he, I'm sorry. The question was, have, have, what about CoreOS and how does that play into this? Um, so CoreOS is 
basically a ultra minimal host operating system that can run in Vagrant, can run in a couple of different places or on their steel. Um, it's not much more than a kernel and some means of updating itself and Docker. And so once you're in Docker, you know, it's, it's fair game. And so there, there's a couple of different things working, and not just core OS, within this space to, to do just what he was talking about earlier. Like, you don't have really much you need on the, the base OS, and I don't actually even need to know that the base OS is one distribution or another, but that it, it can atomic, you know, atomically take care of itself, and I know that my code in my prescribed container will run the same every time, then life is good. And this goes back to Ops knows how to take care of, you know, pristinely take care of what they need to, and the development folks know how to pristinely make run what they need to. So it's, it's all driving at the same conversation. Yes? Uh, two, sort of a two-part question. One, how does networking work in this? And two, where, where do I write data inside my container that isn't blown away when the container dies? Yeah. Networking is networking is uh, a very big conversation, and so Docker does right now, like right out of the box, some IP tables finagling to actually make sure that all of it just passes through as quickly and cleanly as possible. And there's there's already options where you can just disable that and stick in Open vSwitch. Um, and uh, any number of other permutations of however you need to get networking done. Um, most people's development instances of it, it just works out of the box. Most of the time the networking gets into when you have different infrastructures that you need to get them into or you're trying to plumb different containers together, uh, maybe even like multiple Docker instances running in many of the containers to talk to each other not knowing that they're on different hosts. Um, so it's possible and, and it, it allows you, the tools actually allow you to get as complex as you need to on that. So like, does the container have a MAC address? Does it pull an IP? Let's say, here's an example. I have two Docker containers running and I want to access a patch key on each separate container. How does one go about that since they both can be used in play? Try moving your laptop. Try moving your laptop down, down the other end of the table. Over there. Yeah. There's also a volume control on that touch screen that's in the middle. Of the table. Okay. Hmm. Machine running with the Docker, but I see multiple IPs. That's what that lighter window is. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, I didn't realize you jumped out. So it, it, see, it shows, it, you can see that it has a, a loopback and an Ethernet, but from outside Docker, it, I have. <laughs> it's actually Docker Zero. <laughs> yeah, so I actually have my host Ethernet, but then I have Docker O, which, which Everything's netted through, so this is just like a virtual Ethernet device. Um, other question. So let's. So you actually the next one was yeah two part question. So I might be running close on time here. So, for anybody who's familiar with, with Mongo, it is a 
uh, a document storage system, but it, it, it database, but it, it pre-populates a, a, a large database, and I'm not going to do this more than once because it allocates a lot. But I'm going to say Docker run in my current directory, and I'll just call it DB. And I'm going to mount it, and only because I know that this this image that I'm about to run writes its database to slash uh, slash d data slash db. So what, what this command, the breakdown of this command right here is <laughs> just turn it on. Can you press the mute button on the uh, So I'm, doc, doc, I'm, I'm going to run docker dash v is that I'm going to mount in a volume and so dash v is literally saying I'm going to give you the syntax is I'm going to give you a, a, a path on localhost colon the path inside the container and it's going to bind mount that in and so I'm just doing path to working directory slash db and then I want to mount that that directory on my host into the container of this other thing so when I start mongo here Mongo starts up, runs away. You'll see it's doing its, its normal build uh, uh, startup, but it's pre-allocating on the file system. And it, it takes a few seconds because it allocates a, a, about three gigs worth of space. Um, and so here I can actually come into, oh, I'm just gonna slow down my computer. <laughs> So here I can actually see from, from outside the, the host that it's it's actually allocating this this disk space and it's even got the Mongo lock here. Gracious. 89%. So what this allows me to do now is that really as far as I'm concerned with this database is that directory. That is all my you know variant data that would happen from container to container. I could actually destroy the container. I could even upgrade around that container or whatever, but as long as I save that DB directory, the restart will say, oh, here I've got an existing directory. Away I go. All right, so it's done now. You can see all that stuff is there. It's 3.1 gigs. And so here I am on my host. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna control C my docker run instance here. You can see that Mongo is actually running. This is my Mongo instance. Now I'm going to do docker ps. Oh, I forgot to do something. Good, even better. You'll see that now I'm, I'm going to restart this container and it's going to be a lot faster. I'm going to say dash capital P, which just exposes every port that I've prescribed for this image to expose, and it gives it a, a randomly assigned uh, port to listen on. So I'm still pinging Google, that's great. Um, <laughs> so you can actually see here that now, now this is my new instance running the name that it's running, the command that it's running, how long it's been up, and uh, ports is, I'm actually now exposing 49170, which maps to 27017 inside the container, and I'm exposing 49171, which maps to 28017 inside the container. So now my laptop is actually listening publicly on a couple of ports that um, are running inside of this container and I will 49170 I'm connected so here I'm, I'm actually on the host running a Mongo client talking to Mongo daemon which is running inside of a container and um, <coughs> DB farts find nothing DB farts insert no. Cool. So here I did that. I'll go back to my container. I'll kill it. So 
start it again. Docker PS. It's given me a new port now. But so I'll, I'll go up to my new increment of port. <laughs> Who's take a second to appreciate how great the names are? <laughs> 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 so, some, of, some of them are pretty fantastic. Because like it, it uses curry and distracted Because <laughs> uh, uh, some, some of the adjectives are like kick ass, you know. So sometimes you'll see like kick ass tour bulbs, and you're like. <laughs> so here I just I just started. I, I connected to the instance that was running. You can prescribe exactly which port you want to expose it to, so you don't have. And you, if you want to run Apache on 80 on the, the host, you could do that. But like you said, there's not many cases where you're going to say, I have to run it on 80 on both of the hosts. Well, then you have to get into some fancy networking. But It's called IPv6. Oh, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> um, so nonetheless, here I you know, connected. I inserted a row. I actually killed the daemon. I restarted the daemon, but since I was mounted to the directory, it just picked up in the same directory. I reconnect again. I run a find on the, the collection I just made, and there's the record that I, made, I put in. So I didn't actually care that. I just started actually in the new container. Um, the, the containers are just flying by, but the data that I'm actually caring about it is there. But every so. container that you started is still extant on the system. Yeah. The images don't go away. If, even if you power down the system entirely, you can still restart that particular container. So you don't you don't lose data just because you power down a system or, or a container. Correct. So um, it was talking about the question was, or statement was about losing containers. So here you saw Docker PS. But if I run docker ps-a to get all the containers, you can actually see what I've done so far. And in the status column, you'll see that they exited zero or some other state. state. Um, but presently, I've only got one that's been up for two minutes. And so those, those stay around until you delete them. You can delete, you know, there's a Docker RM to remove prior, prior containers, but you could also say Docker start. Uh, yeah, drunk bike. And so, so now I've actually just started another instance of this, and I can say PSEO um, grep for Mongo, and I, I should actually have two Mongo. No, no. Why did I not start? Hi, I Einstein. Jeez. That's great. <laughs> well, he, he got together with Thirsty Hockey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they started, and, and they probably, they probably just been started reviewing the kick-ass Feynman at that point. So. <laughs> or maybe Elegant Curie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. It looks good. So, nonetheless, I, I, I just, I just started, started by Einstein, and then I just reattached right to it. And so... Brilliant. Uh, that, that was actually a prior, you know, prior container that I'd already started, run, killed, and I just said restart that container and put me right back in the bash shell that I had called before. So yes, this is, this is also possible. Um, and you can remove those or figure out how you're going to life cycle them for whatever your use case is. Same is true for document, yeah, for image building. Um, okay, so I'm, uh, we, need to, we need to get to beer drinking. Uh, so that, that, that's all a lot of interactive commands. The thing that makes this also start interesting, start getting interesting is that there's Docker files. And so you can actually prescribe a Docker file that reads almost like a script. And you can say Docker build dash T to tag it, you know, with my container and do these things. And so this, this, this little subsection is pretty much what I just did for this Mongo image that we were just running is that I said, from Fedora, from the Fedora image, I want you to run this command. So it installed Mongo server and made the directory that I wanted it to be at. Exposed this port, expose that volume, which has some other implications because you could actually have multi-volume sh you know, sharing between. And then uh, as a container, you know, by default it won't do a command. That's why you say docker run Fedora bash. But this one I want you to default to saying mongod. 
And that's it. Mongo, and then you say Docker build, tag it, my Mongo dot. And it looks in that directory and says, hey, I've got a Docker file. Great, let's go. And it packages up this thing. And so you could now very easily have a, a running instance of some environment, even, you know, like now I'm running something in Fedora and my laptop is, you know, CentOS or something. I don't know. Uh, so that's the image that only has the things. What's that? that? That's the image that has just the, not all of the Fedora base, just your whatever line layer is installed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's where in that, in that prior, uh, when I showed the tree, mm -hmm. you saw all the Fedora stuff and then a few steps down. Each one of those instructions was a step down. Pretty neat. Um, so there, there are, there are, there are registries. There's a public registry that you can actually push if you want the whole world to share it. But if you have like a local LAN or something in your house or work network, you can have you can stand up a Docker registry and be able to tag and push and pull from that uh, just just fine. So if you did have something you didn't want the whole world to share, but you needed to have multiple instances of it running, this is very workable. Um, yeah, links between containers for different use cases. What do you mean by links? If you if you wanted to say that uh, I, I you know I, I stand up a, some service and uh, there's a couple of different use cases for this, but more or less you want to have a named thing that your container shares, and then you want to stand up something else, almost like MySQL to, to HTTPD, that you could actually just say start HTTPD HTTPD and link to that MySQL instance over there, so you could actually have containers sharing services across them. So you're not having to bundle yeah. the whole okay. kitchen sink into a container. But you still got dynamically assigned IP addresses and ports, but they're aware, like one's configured based on that IP and port of the other. Yeah, the IP tables yeah. Yeah, will link them together as if they know they can just talk to each other. Oh, and they'll that, look as though they're local services. Oh. Yeah. So with the volume, uh, the registries, uh, yeah. you can, having a, uh, can you have a, does it have a built-in system for having a, um, a authentication? So if you have a registry server, you can authenticate to that instead of having it just on private LAN uh, for the private registry? There, it, the, the API supports HTTP off, and there's other stuff in the works for that so that you could actually have like ACLs for a, for a private registry. But the public index.docker.io has a username that's created, and there's like a command to actually log in and set that up so that you can be able to push to only yours out on the, the internet, the, the cloud. But the, for a local registry, I haven't actually even cared to get that far in it just because usually I'll stand it up to say, I'm going to start this box. And um, I mean, Anyhow, you could actually just say docker tag this thing to the host name slash the name and then docker push and it will push to that alternate machine. And so it's very easy. There's actually containers that have registries. So you could actually say docker run vbats docker registry. It's running. Tag it to that the IP and port that that thing is running on. Tag my container to this. Push it to that. Now somebody else can pull straight from this locally. So you, it, it's very quick to start moving containers around, even if you had to share it within the local network. Yes? So like, uh, in the world of cloud, there's kind of a lot of other projects even in Red Hat. Um, what are those open stack? Um, what do you know about, I guess, that and how maybe it could fit into Docker? The current, uh, I'm not very heavy in the open stack arena, but the current Ice House release that's mm -hmm. coming down the pipe or pike or however you want to say it, um, May-ish timeline, is going to support Docker. Yeah, but the OpenStack guys are all over this as well. Other cloudy things is um, that OpenShift is also looking to integrate this, such that, have any of you played with OpenShift? Yeah, rock on. So the gears and cartridges that you you can say like, I want a, you know, a Ruby cartridge or whatever, that eventually, that this will also likely be backed by a Docker container rather than a, and a you know, very well orchestrated layout like it is now, such that when you go to access your app or twiddle with your app, it feels like you're in your own little Linux. 
you know, and so it doesn't really matter. You could, you could actually just say yum install these other things or gem install whatever, and not have to worry about the custom little place that you're in. Just make sure your app runs and exposes these things. Great, wonderful. Um, what operating systems are on the roadmap, and um, what's the kind of you said that one is coming imminently, but is there a guess at that, that summer or next year or? Uh, so, the imminent thing that I mentioned was was the 1.0 release of Docker. I, I'm not privy to any timeline on that. Um, it, it, it very well might be a few versions out, like they just did 0.9.0. It might be a few bumps out from there. I have no idea that. That's the imminent piece. Architectures and operating systems, it presently, you know, all this interoperability that we've talked about, it's presently Linux 64-bit, but that's that, that's that's what it's currently is Linux 64-bit. Anything in that playground, go go nuts. The words that I've gotten from, or heard from upstream is that future, you know, Linux 32, 64, ARM, OS X, you know, BSD. It. The, the vision is that you could actually be on any given host and run any other given host within the container, and they're working on how how all they're going to facilitate that. So that is upstream's bigger vision. Presently, as far as most people are concerned, it's Linux 64-bit until that comes to fruition. Yes. Are you wondering what they say architecture specific? Is it just implementation? It seems like. Yeah, there's there's probably I, I I have not dug into that. I mean, I'm sure that there's some things that you could just do like set arc on and be able to run in different environments, but I I haven't even bridged into that that far. Yeah. Um, so you said that you this as well. But so it comes the time you want to. Upgrade your base image, or upgrade your not base image, your, your, your top image, mm -hmm. container, whatever you call it. Um, what, what are the what mechanics? Do do? <laughs> what are the mechanics of doing that? The the update model is a well dis well con converse conversed, well talked about thing, um, <laughs> because effectively because of the. Because of the Docker file model, that you can just respin something, and there, there's you just respin it. Effectively, you could just respin it, and so there, there, there you, you will have cases where I can't, I can't, I can't, yeah, I can't recreate it exactly. Next time I run bundle install, something's not quite right. Next time I run Maven build, something's a little different. Um, there are those cases that are going to have to be addressed, but effectively. If you did have a tree that was like this, then you're the logo on the totem pole, and you know, GNU TLS gets updated back here, for instance. <laughs> and uh, so it comes down here, and next time you would run from Fedora latest, it would actually be a different hash. Uh, you'd have a new ancestor in the line, and you know, God willing, you, you're, you're, you end up with exactly the same thing, but uh, that, that update model is something that's still being fine-tuned fine or as I to say, every time I run it, it, it gets, it's very consistent. What, uh, what hashing algorithm does it use to hash out the... <laughs> Which piece? <laughs> the, um, um, the overall most, container hash. Yeah, most of the time it's, it's, it's a, some kind of it, it uses some uniqueness on a SHA-256 hash. Uh, but how it goes about calculating some of the different sums varies greatly within the implementation, whether or not it's just check summing certain bits of it or the whole whole piece of it. But the long bit is a SHA-256 hash. Cool. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. I, know, I love all the questions. This is great. Um, so feel free to get out there. That uh, I think the only thing that I neglected to put on the whole slide slideshow is that it's GitHub.com/slash/docker. Um, 
at this point, DocCloud was their prior name. They're just Docker. But it's a very, very active group. Uh, on Freenode, they're pound dockers hyphen dev if you actually want to start hacking on Docker. And they have you to review and discuss pull requests. And it's written in Golang. Has anybody ever written anything in Golang yet? Yay, two people. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are gonna have to play with Golang. If you, if you, who, who, in, if you'll admit to this, this is like, sometimes I feel like people think this is admitting that you like the Spice Girls, but who, who enjoys, <laughs> who enjoys writing in Ruby? Okay, so most, most people have different mixed feelings about it. Ruby is actually a very fun language to write in, even if at some point you realize that it's impossible to debug. But Ruby and Python, Ruby and Python are, are like fun to write. But then if you, if you could actually have some of the things about C, you know, aspects of C and C++ and Java, but have fun writing it, <laughs> this, this, this is Golang. Um, and it's, it's really a, a great upstream community to work with. And so Docker is actually written all in Golang as well. So if you want to venture out there, they're, they're very willing to accept pull requests into this project. All right, well, thank, thank you all for your time. Um, drinks with butter wings. Otherwise, you can chat in the foyer um, until about nine o'clock, which is another fifteen minutes. So, thank you for all for coming.